Hello. Oh, yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, and welcome to the session of the Policy Network on Internet Fragmentation. Um, my name is Bruna Santos. I am one of the co-facilitators of this Policy Network together with Chital and Wim. Um, and we would like to just welcome everybody to um, another discussion. It's a very happy um, moment for us. It's the second year of the Policy Network and we're very glad to be presenting to you guys today a little discussion on how the framework has evolved and um, to do a deep dive on the policy, the discussion paper that we, the Policy Network just put out. So the session today will be a little bit of a presentation of the discussion paper and also some um, debates between both the pen holders of the document and some community commentators um, on the three aspects um, that we describe in the policy network framework. So, and, and before we move on to that, I just wanted to start with a very big thank to every single volunteer of the policy network that helped us shape this document. Um, some of them are on the stage with us and some of them are also here in this room. So thanks a lot for joining the conversation and, and helping us construct um, this debate. Um, I'm going to hand the floor to you, Wim, right? And then we can move on with the agenda. Thank you. And this is on. And as you see, we have a presentation. I think the first, Bruna, thank you. You already gave the overview of the, uh, of the agenda. Um, so I will give the brief introduction. My name is uh, Wim Dugesel. I'm uh, part of the policy networks, uh, they are an intersessional activity uh, by the uh, IGF. Uh, that means that they also receive support by the IGF Secretariat and I'm uh, with the Secretariat as consultant to help uh, this, best uh, this uh, policy network um, to start. So a brief introduction on the uh, policy network on internet fragmentation. It is an intersessional activity that means we not only work at this uh, IGF meeting, but we start uh, way earlier. We started working in, uh, in May and even before that uh, to prepare and work to this session uh, and to the IGF. So it is um, the policy network internet fragmentation. There are other policy networks also on the agenda, but this one uh, on internet fragmentation has the um, or wants to uh, further the discussion and raise awareness on fragmentation on technical policy, legal and regulatory measures that may and actions that may pose a risk to the open and interconnected interoperable internet. So what are now the objectives of the policy network? Uh, as Bruna mentioned, this is the second year uh, of the policy network. What we wanted to do was to uh, understand uh, what is actually meant with internet fragmentation. So come up with a comprehensive framework and overview uh, of what inter -fragmentation, internet fragmentation is. We look at case studies, uh, what actually is, uh, is happening in, try to come up with, uh, with examples or look for, for examples. And then the third question is what, what to do about it, uh, how to address or how to try to avoid fragmentation. This Looking back to um, uh, what we did last year, um, we actually dove into those questions. And um, as often is the case, you want to find the definition and try to define what you're working on. Uh, through the webinars, like you see, we had uh, webinars uh, during the year asking specifically that question, what uh, does it actually mean to people when they talk about internet fragmentation and what should and what can be done about it and who should be doing what. Very quickly through this, those webinars and those discussions uh, we had, it, be it became clear that trying to come up with a definition is not really uh, something that is, is still possible. It might have been possible earlier on, but at this, uh, how the people are discussing and looking at fragmentation uh, Trying to squeeze that all in one clear definition is not helpful. What we did instead, or through the work, it became clear when there are different views on what fragmentation is. And that's uh, how last year, as the outcome of last year's discussion, we came up with a framework uh, saying actually 
if we listen to the, to the people, if we listen to uh, the comments we get, uh, we kind of can form three baskets of what people um, see and understand as, uh, as fragmentation. What's in those bas baskets we will further discuss and hear from the, uh, the panelists today. Uh, but that, and I think that was the main uh, output of our, um, of our work last year, that allowed us to come up with, uh, with a framework. The framework you see uh, in small, and this, I think, is a larger version. So, a framework that said, well, we found that when people are talk talking about fragmentation, we can either form a basket uh, that we can label as uh, fragmentation of internet user experience, um, fragmentation of internet governance and coordination, or people really refer to fragmentation of the technical layer, technical architecture of the internet. That were the baskets uh, that we could form uh, with the important uh, comment we got. Uh, those baskets are not alone, are not completely separate. Uh, there are interactions, there are overlaps uh, between them and that's uh, they shouldn't be considered as uh, specific, as separate, uh, separate silos. Uh, one comment uh, before I hand over to, uh, to Shital to discuss what we actually did uh, this year, uh, is we labeled the framework as, it is a framework for discussing internet fragmentation. We don't want to come up with a framework to define what it is, but we from the beginning said, well, we, this framework should help to discuss and, and further the discussion. Uh, because I think that's one of the uh, main evolutions we saw in the work and in, in our discussions, is that people started to move from, well, we need to define something and then we need to discuss, in kind of an understanding that it is important uh, to discuss with stakeholders and have these stake, multi-stakeholder discussions on internet fragmentation, but these stakeholders are not necessarily always the same. It is possible in those three layers of our framework that you need to sit together with different stakeholders or different types of people, different organizations. Uh, and I think that's one of the major, or, or one of the main findings we, uh, we had last year in our work. Together with, uh, and that's, probably will become clear out, uh, out of today's discussion. The second point is that what uh, those different groups are in those different uh, layers, they come up with actually guidance or guidelines or ideas on how to avoid or uh, address fragmentation, will not necessary or does not necessary, uh, is completely complementary with each other. So at the end of the discussion, it will still be necessary to across those baskets have discussions on uh, how to actually address NDA. Uh, so that's what we did last year. I hope that was uh, clear. Uh, so I end here. This was the framework, and that was also the start of our discussions uh, this year. So I hand over to you, Shital. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Rim. I it's great to be here and to be presenting our uh, output for this year. And as Bruna said, um, we co-facilitate this policy network. And it's really nice, I think, to now not be doing so much of the, the work, um, but to be hearing from you. Um, once we've heard from the uh, drafters and the commentators who will be responding to the, to the drafters of this, this year's um, output, uh, we really want to hear from you. So the work is going to be in the room. Um, and then, um, as, as, as you could see from the agenda as well, we will also be looking for feedback after this session. So what have we done this year? As Wim said, um, we have been building on the work of last year where we developed a framework to conceptualize what internet fragmentation um, is understood as by, uh, as, we, as we have just discussed, me in many different ways. And so this framework we, um, we developed is to, to support, it's really a tool to support better understanding and clarification um, of what internet fragmentation is. And in that sense, what we were able to do this year is further unpack what the framework is and those three areas 
which Wim outlined. Um, and those are the fragmentation of the um, technical layer, the user experience, and, in, and governance and coordination. And what we wanted to do in unpacking these areas was better understand what the priorities should be in each area, so what, what is actually harmful um, and negative and from that assess what can be done. So develop some recommendations for action and where we are really, I think, looking forward to hearing from, from you all and, and from, from those who have been so involved already is, uh, well, really, whether or not you think that these recommendations are, are helpful, um, whether anything is missing. and. Um, and whether you, you think the way that there are the different elements of the framework have been unpacked um, and what has been prioritized it aligns with your view of what we should be focusing on as an international community when it comes to this, this issue. So uh, what we um, are going to do is take each, um, each element of the framework one by one. And I also invite you to go to the PNIF's webpage and look at the discussion paper as uh, we're discussing it here um, and, um, and consider uh, also um, in the second part of this session uh, how you may want to um, re react uh, to, to what is being presented. So we're going to do first of all a presentation of each uh, track or each element um, and so we have, uh, we have the very hardworking drafters um, of the of the output document here, and um, we're going to go one by one. Hear from them. They're going to just present the top level uh, finding findings or the top level points. Um, so what priorities they they found uh, they ne uh, need to be addressed, and then some of the recommendations, and then we'll have a commentator uh, to to respond. And so we'll do that for each, and then we will uh, open up. So without further ado, um, I'd like to hand over to Rosalind Kenny Birch, who is um, with, the, with the UK government at the Department for Science, Innovation, and Technology. And um, Ros, you worked with others to develop uh, the, uh, the chapter in our document um, focused on internet governance and coordination and um, the fragmentation of that. So uh, in the next three or four minutes, would you be able to just provide an overview of what that chapter says and the recommendations that you have for addressing um, this element of fragmentation? Thank you. Thanks very much, Sheetal, and great to see everyone here today. Um, I think one of the points of this panel discussion, too, is to really provoke a conversation. Um, our multi-stakeholder um, uh, working group that worked on this chapter had um, quite a few different perspectives because fragmentation is um, such a complex topic it can be to discuss. So it will be really interesting to hear your insights here today um, from a wider group of perspectives. Um, and so I would really invite you to engage in the discussion, offer some of your own insights and challenge afterwards as well. Um, but just to present on uh, what we've written up in the preliminary uh, draft chapter, on fragmentation at the governance layer of the internet, I'd first like to lay out a little bit of context. Um, so our multi-stakeholder working group uh, draft wrote that um, fragmentation at the governance layer primarily relates to the interactions between global internet governance and standards bodies. When these bodies do not coordinate inclusively, it can and does result in fragmentation. This fragmentation can manifest in siloed or duplicative discussions and exclusion of specific groups from participation, resulting in decisions being taken without consensus from the global multi-stakeholder community. And it's important to note too that fragmentation at the governance layer can also create knock-on effects at the other layers of the internet, user experience and the technical layer. 
So there were a couple of different uh, components to our analysis about where fragmentation can sort of emerge or come from at the governance layer. And one was uh, duplicative mandates. So if part of a specific internet governance body's um, mandate is unclear or may have overlapping elements with a different body, this can foster a competition for legitimacy or create confusion uh, between bodies. And therefore, that can make it difficult for stakeholders to know where and when they need to engage in a specific conversation. Another uh, point we observed was when mandates are exclusive or don't fully empower all elements of the multi-stakeholder uh, community uh, to participate. So we see inclusion as uh, central to combating that so that people can participate on an equal footing. Um, and then finally, taking actions at the right level. So individual government's actions can sometimes lead to divergence in the rules applied to the internet and its management. And in that sense, it's really important that national governments and internet governance global bodies are closely conversing about um, issues, specifically when they're being uh, developed or discussed through multi-stakeholder um, processes already. So with some of those analytical points, uh, we proposed a couple of different recommendations. And again, very eager to get um, uh, a wide range of perspectives and feedback on this today. But one was not to introduce further bodies into the internet governance landscape. The internet governance landscape is already complex. And as we all well know um, through all our travels, uh, there are a lot of different uh, conferences, uh, events taking place uh, that we engage with across bodies um, already and people only have so much time and only so much financial resource to be able to engage in these. So further perpetuating that complex landscape could um, end up excluding people from discussions uh, if they don't have the resources to fully participate in more and more emerging bodies and spaces. However, that being said, another recommendation we made was therefore, it is important to improve coordination between existing internet governance bodies to help, uh, to help address perceived or real gaps in these spaces. So coordination between existing internet governance bodies is needed uh, to help um, address that as well. Uh, thirdly, and in order to avoid siloed public policy discussions regarding internet governance, all internet governance bodies must be fully inclusive to stakeholders and enable meaningful multi-stakeholder participation on an equal footing. We also believed that that would help ex address uh, instances of fragmentation at the governance layer. And then finally, we recommend that existing global internet governance bodies must engage more closely with national governments. So this goes um, back to our point of analysis before. There's actually a two-way street here. Um, national governments, when looking at proposed legislation, can actually really benefit from talking to global internet governance bodies about their plans and therefore receive important information and feedback. But equally, global internet governance bodies should be on the front foot about engaging with governments um, and ensure that governments know what activities are going on in the global space to help potentially avoid duplicative um, measures. So I'll stop there. And um, again, an exciting part of this panel is we'll now receive some challenge and other perspectives on this work. So uh, with that, I hand over um, to Jordan Carter. Um, great to have you here. Uh, thank you, Roz, and good morning, everyone. My name is Jordan Carter. I work for the AU Domain Administration, the CCTLD manager for .au. Um, and it's a pleasure to offer a few not very provocative provocations to the group to help the conversation happen. Um, uh, I am making some personal remarks. I'm not advancing an, an out of position here. Um, Overall, I think this is a, a good start to the discussion around um, fragmentation, and I, my congratulations to the volunteers. I should disclose that aside from joining the email list a couple of months ago, uh, I have not been involved in any way in this paper. I was reading it fresh uh, to prepare for this session. Um, and I agree with the analysis so far as it goes. So uh, in the end, my provocation is, is relatively brief. 
Um, the importance of broad-based participation is vital, uh, particularly in the standards bodies and in some of the global internet governance uh, organizations like ICANN. Uh, the Western bias in participation is un undeniable and meaningful participation from around the globe and from the groups that are not participating is absolutely essential to within whatever framework that we have. Um, when I read the very first box, the definition here, fragmentation of internet governance primarily relates to the interactions between global internet governance and standards bodies. My core thesis might be that that's too narrow a definition of, of governance fragmentation because one of the key agents of governance are governments. And if to not deal with government-driven, policy-driven fragmentation in this section, I think maybe complicates the picture, though I'm sure I can in turn be challenged about that. Um, you know, and part of the challenge there is that the definition of internet governance itself is under challenge. You know, do we think that it's just about the governance of the internet, which is a distinction that has been made, or is it the governance on the internet, or is it these broader questions of digital governance that get uh, often tacked on to those infrastructure level discussions today? Um, another challenge I think it would be worth taking into account in the governance fragmentation is that caused by the narrow mandates of a lot of the technical internet governance organizations. Uh, those narrow mandates are there for good reasons, but sometimes they make it difficult for those organizations to actually deal with a systemic view of what's going on in the internet. So you can have a situation where each silo is dealing with its narrow mandate, and none of them are prepared to take a view about the system as a whole. Um, and so I think there are some institutional drivers there at the global internet governance level towards fragmentation. Um, the paper talks about the need for better coordination, and I agree, and it suggests further research, and I agree. Uh, but quite a lot of the people who are involved in these global internet governance bodies could undertake meaningful coordination together without further research. They just need to start doing it. Um, some of it is being done, uh, but the challenge not to this paper, but to those organizations is get coordinating. Get, get coordinating in the face of the challenges that the internet is throwing up and in the challenges to the governance model that we see today. Um, and I really did appreciate the paper calling out the duplication and the risks with some of the uh, proposals in the Secretary General's policy brief for a digital cooperation forum, for example. The last thing that we need is uh, duplicative institutions being established uh, with new resources going to fund them instead of the resources that the IGF, for example, is crying out for and could make good use of. Uh, and the last point I want to make, I guess, um, having argued that the governance uh, discussion could use maybe a broader look, is the the multi-stakeholder driven internet governance system and the multilateral or state-based regulatory and legal system, um, I think need to be much better at working effectively together. Um, the two can and should shape each other and the multi-stakeholder dialogues in organizations like the, ITF, uh, like the IGF could usefully uh, inform policy if more of the people doing public policy related to the internet were aware of their work. Um, so I'll probably wrap it up there. I don't know if that was provocative enough, but um, thank you for the chance to comment. Thank you so much, Jordan. And we will be going through each of the elements of the framework first before we open up. Um, and I also wanted to let you know that we had some written feedback from the community when we published the paper and uh, wanted to weave in some of that into this discussion as well. So as it, um, there was one point of feedback relevant to the, the, the gov internet governance and coordination chapter. Um, it was really about providing concrete examples of how governance fragmentation causes internet fragmentation. Um, and just, it was checking that 
what our understanding in the paper that you put out in the paper is of internet governance um, and coordination fragmentation is essentially that the existence of multiple uncoordinated international processes is a source of fragmentation. So if so, why is that treated differently uh, than governmental and corporate sourced fragmentation, which are both addressed under user experience, um, which we'll come on to. Uh, so I think there's a question there about what is the focus of this chapter? Is it on the, the existence of multiple uncoordinated processes, which I think you have addressed, and, and that is the focus. Um, and then, uh, Jordan, you mentioned the importance of ensuring uh, coherence or at least um, engagement and, and um, coordination. And it might be interesting to hear from you later, but also from everyone here and online, whether you uh, have any um, ideas for concrete mechanisms or examples that are already existing for how that coordination can effectively take place. So without further ado, we'll move on then before we open up to the second uh, chapter. Um, and we have here Vittorio Bertola, who was one of the co-drafters of this chapter um, within the group. And I know Vittorio wear many hats, so um, <laughs> I don't know how you prefer to, um, to, to be um, introduced, but please, please do provide your, um, well, please do um, choose to your hat. Um, and then over, an overview of the work that you've done in this year uh, to assess the priorities um, in the user experience uh, fragmentation uh, that we, we had um, outlined last year, and then also the recommendations that you've put forward. It's a very hefty, chapter of the discussion document. So good luck with um, summarizing it in three or four minutes. Yes, it's, it's pretty hard. Well, I don't know, maybe my head is like having gray hair and having been for, for too many years in this kind of discussions, almost 25 now. But I, I work for Open Exchange, which is a German open source uh, software company. And so, I mean, I, I was one of the people that tried to tackle this problem of uh, user uh, experience fragmentation, which is, I think, the hardest and most vague one it's uh, because uh, the entire discussion on fragmentation started from the technical level, and then multiple stakeholders try to add more things into it, and user experience things are mostly coming from, from this kind of approach. So we tried to go for a definition which is uh, completely open and pretty broad, basically by saying that anything that makes two, di two different users of the internet see different things when they try to access the same service, website, whatever, or do the same thing over the internet is a form of user-level fragmentation. Fragmentation. And of course, if you take this very broad approach, then there's the need to tell between the positive cases and the negative cases. Because there are many situations in which actually this difference in experience is, is a good thing. It's made to help the user, for, to customize content for them, or it's made to protect the user, to give them rights, for example, in, uh, through privacy laws in specific countries. Or, or it's done, for example, to prevent them from accessing uh, unhealthy, like malware websites or whatever. So you have to then define what is a negative uh, case of fragmentation. There could be another approach, and some people have argued for it, of just finding a definition that covers only the negative cases, but then we found this becomes harder and harder. So we, we'd rather take then a case-by-case -case approach. So by starting from this very broad definition, we, we identified several priorities in different cases, and then we want to work on them one by one because they all have a, a different uh, need and a different view to be taken into account. So, so we identified the two major sources of this kind of fragmentation, and uh, it, it's never the user. Usually it's, it's either a government that for some reason wants to exert sovereignty and modify the experience for their own citizens only, uh, or it's uh, a company, usually the global platforms, that uh, wants to build like this kind of uh, ecosystem or walled gardens, how you want to call them, that uh, basically uh, prevents users from going somewhere else because they want, of course, to exploit them for business reasons. And, and so through, this, through this two, uh, these two opposite pushes, a number of phenomena uh, emerge. So we identified six priorities. And uh, the three top ones, the, the ones we would start with, are, well, first of all, internet shutdowns. 
there were no, these are the principles anyway. Uh, the, the internet uh, shutdowns, we discussed a bit whether it's a user experience level thing or a technical thing, it was, but in the end we decided we could discuss it at this level, and we think they are a negative thing. So, so, so we already received, received a comment of someone in the community saying that there's actually something like a positive internet shutdown. I, I don't know what it is, but it will be up for discussion. Uh, and then we, we, uh, the, the second priority we identified is the, the case in which national blocking or law enforcement orders have global effects, so spilling over to other, to other jurisdictions and creating, let's say, issues or, I mean, problems to other countries and other citizens. Uh, uh, and then the third case was the walled gardens I mentioned. So basically, uh, the building of barriers uh, through uh, in, uh, in the restriction of user choice and competition, both by governments when they have like uh, laws that favor, for example, national products over the global ones, but also by the uh, global internet platforms. And then there's more because we 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 also would like to discuss uh, national level censorship where, when content gets blocked for political reasons. We 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 would like to discuss the violations of network neutrality, which are which are another issue. And the last one is the geoblocking for intellectual property reasons. So as you see, there's a long thing, list of things to do, and I encourage people in the community to participate even on specific issues. So we, we tried, I mean, we, we don't think we can make suggestions for everything at the same time together, but we tried to identify five principles that are summarized in the slide. Uh, basically, the idea we would like to start with is that there should be a principle of equality, meaning the default should be that everybody should be able to access everything in the same way. And then the second principle is a partial correction to this. It's, it's a principle of enhancement. So when the, the, the dis differentiation, the customization is done in the interest of the user or asked for by the user, uh, then it's a good thing, and so we don't need to worry about it. The problem is when this is gets imposed onto users by a third party against the, the wish, and then in this case you could have negative effects. Uh, so the, the first suggestion is that we should have an impact assessment whenever you do something that creates a, a deviation from the global internet, whether it's a, a national regulation, national law, or, or, or even a business decision. Then there should be harmonization. So the idea is that, uh, especially in regulatory terms, we should rely as far as possible on global agreements on how to tackle the same problem in the same way everywhere, and only go to national regulation when either the harmonization is missing or doesn't take into account any national needs. But then the, the last and maybe most important principle is that, in the end, uh, there should always be free choice. So the users should be free to choose how they use the internet and where to go. And uh, unless there are very important reasons to make that, I mean, to prevent that from happening, in the end, uh, the user should always be trusted to be able to do the, the good thing. So thank you. I think we have Mariel as a commentator, and I give the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I really like your presentation. Um, well, let me start by saying konnichiwa. You know, uh, and uh, my name is Mariel Oliveira. I'm the director for digital inclusion policies and transformation in the communications and information sector of UNESCO. And, um, you know, this work for the policy network on fragmentation is particularly, you know, important to us because what my team and, and, and I do is essentially defend freedom of expression, access to information and privacy. And these are the rights that are most directly impacted by uh, fragmentation. So, I mean, uh, uh, first I want to say also a big congrats to Bruno, Chitao and, and, and Wim who have been steering this work uh, um, since the last year. And, it's shaping up super well, you know. So, um, well, let me say that to me, the user experience fragmentation is maybe the most interesting type just because it has this positive side when users are served with custom, you know, uh, uh, features or content, and et cetera, and the negative side when users are actually prevented from accessing certain features uh, and, and service and content. And, and the discussion paper is actually concerned very much primarily with the negative side um, which is essentially about how, you know, these features, uh, uh, these, these me mechanisms actually impose barriers that isolate or trap users into an information environment um, from which they can't really escape. And a consequence of isolation and a major source of the harms that happen uh, uh, by this type of, uh, uh, as a consequence of this type of fragmentation is essentially that it enables serving trap users different world views than are served from uh, other uh, internet users. And that brings a really important uh, uh, point that maybe is not quite explicit in the paper yet, but, uh, but I like that uh, it was mentioned, uh, alluded to in the, in the presentation just made, is that negative uh, uh, user experience fragmentation actually affects all users, not just the ones immediately 
uh, deprived of access uh, to the internet or to specific content and services. Some of the users that are excluded are prevented from enjoying their human rights to uh, uh, access to information or their freedom of expression and other rights, but, uh, and they may end up being driven to echo chambers and, and elements like that. But it's also true that the non-targeted users who are deprived of their rights to freely associate with, uh, with those uh, uh, who are isolated to seek information from them and impart information to them. And therefore, you know, this, the, the consequence is that these two groups end up kind of dri uh, um, driven apart. There is an increasing gap in the information and knowledge uh, 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 between them, and that separates people. And, and many times, especially when it's done for political purposes, the like, co likely consequences, polarization, which then spills beyond the internet and into the real world and actually may affect even non-internet users. You know, so I think that this is a particularly you know, uh, 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 important topic. Um, in UNESCO, we work with uh, what we call the Rome Principles uh, for Internet Development, in which the internet uh, should be human rights-based, open to all, accessible by all, most stakeholder-led. And the use, user experience fragmentation is very much about the explicit decisions that reduce openness and accessibility, which then has consequences for human rights and when we talk about bad fragmentation, is essentially not done uh, by a multi-stakeholder process. It tends to be a very, multi, you know, kind of a unilateral uh, decision process. Um, one of the things that I really liked about the paper is that it actually laid out principles specifically for fragmentation uh, that, that were mentioned in the presentation, and particularly this issue of free choice and equality of access and uh, enhancement of experience and others. These are very much in line with the existing principles and particularly uh, with the human, uh, uh, human rights framework. And, and the paper actually received a number of comments already, um, including a suggestion that these principles regarding user experience be explicitly based in human rights uh, standards and processes, which are already you know, globally acceptable, uh, accepted, and there is a, like a solid jurisprudence foundation around them. And um, in particularly, it just uh, said that uh, we need to consider the three-part test on legitimacy uh, of interferences with the uh, freedom of expression. Um, and uh, so this is a, uh, an element that I think it would be important to add to the, to the paper as well. Um, some of the points uh, that have been already made uh, through comments is that uh, there's some content that actually um, is relevant to block, that is legitimate to block because they are, you know, there's a law that prescribes their blocking, uh, they pursue a legitimate aim, and they are in line with a democratic society. And content like that, for example, has to do with child pornography, terrorism, incitement of violence, and things like that. And this has not yet been reflected in the paper on how we're going to be kind of uh, disambiguating between those two, th 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 these different types. And the next type in the next draft, I think, would be you know, uh, should be including some of that and maybe even making reference to the speech, you know, and debates around uh, what is awful versus what lawful. Um, and, um, you know, maybe just to finalize, I think that the paper would also benefit uh, from bringing up some of the potential mitigation measures, including, for example, talking about uh, um, enforcing uh, platform interoperability, data portability, strengthening users, media and information literacy, that can counteract the effects of the echo chambers and the disinformation and other, you know, that are created by uh, fragmentation. And so, I mean, I, I'm gonna end up here because I know that um, you would love to hear the comments from our participants as well. Thank you very much for the chance to comment. Thank you, Marielsa, that was great. And you were very positive about the, um, <laughs> about the chapter. And um, I think you also very helpfully reacted, though, to some of the feedback that we got online, um, the written feedback, which uh, I, I have to say was really helpful and constructive. So um, you can also access it on the web page. But um, quite a lot of it focused on the need to be more explicit. Um, about the use of different terms, um, the connection between uh, the um, 
the uh, human rights standards and, and um, negative user experience fragmentation um, and explaining the difference between what is called um, the negative and harmful fragmentation um, in terms of user experience. And as I said, being more explicit about that. So uh, it was great to hear you respond to that as well, because I think um, when we come to you on the floor and online, uh, please do sort of pick up some of those points or, or add your own. Uh, but certainly a lot of really helpful feedback already uh, from, um, from you, Mariel. So thank you for that. So we are going to move now to the, um, the chapter that looked at technical layer fragmentation. And Olaf Koltman is here with us um, to present the, the chapter, um, and really looking forward to hearing from you, Olaf, and then you're going to be um, joined um, afterwards, or we are going to be joined by Suresh um, Krishnan um, from the Internet Architecture Board who will respond, and then we'll open up. So please do get ready with your um, reflections and questions. Without further ado, over to you, Olaf. Thank you very much. My name is Olaf Kolkman. I work with the Internet Society. I'm principal there. Um, chapter on technical uh, infrastructure. Uh, when we speak about technical infrastructure of the Internet, that is the network of networks that are internetworking to provide global connectivity. 80,000 networks that interconnect to provide global connectivity and the supporting infrastructure that makes that happen. That's for us the uh, sort of internet technical uh, infrastructure. Now, a few ideas that we had in constructing this chapter, I wanna, I wanna highlight those without going to the details of the chapter itself. Um, but first, I want to urge people to review this. This is a work in progress, and it becomes stronger when stakeholders engage in the doc with the document and uh, uh, provide comments. At this moment, I feel that there have been uh, uh, too many, uh, too little eyes on uh, uh, on this on this chapter, and and we can use help. Anyway, the, um, the document or the chapter starts with uh, saying that uh, uh, t uh, the technical fragmentation is not something that is clearly defined. There is a, uh, a, a operationalized definition of fragmentation around. Uh, it's a work by Baltra and Heidemann, but they, they sort of have a criterion that says if 50% of the public IP addresses cannot reach the other 50%, then you have a fragmented internet. That's a very, very fragmented internet. Um, that means that half of the population cannot reach the other half of the population. And I think we don't want to be there. It's like you're losing your hair uh, uh, and uh, at some point you're bald and uh, that 50% that point, that's true baldness, I would say. Um, so how to prevent getting bald? That's, that's sort of the question. What we also said is uh, fragmentation is not necessarily um, everything where uh, people choose to not interoperate and not internetwork. And there are cases like that, like my, my home network, my home automation network, my own home automation network does not need to be on the internet directly. That's a choice. That's a choice you can make. Yesterday in a session on fragmentation, somebody said you have good fragmentation and bad fragmentation. Um, I, I sort of like that idea. Um, decentralization is not fragmentation. Lack of connectivity because you choose not to connect is not, uh, uh, fragment, uh, is not fragmentation. Temporarily uh, having to reroute your traffic because of, their, the, of a network problem, so to speak, not fragmentation. But what is fragmentation? How do we define it then? Well, again, that's, that's very difficult. But, but we, 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 the approach that we took um, is uh, using the critical properties um, uh, as, as one of the frameworks. There are multiple frameworks that we point to. Uh, the critical properties that the, uh, the framework that the Internet Society developed 
that basically defines uh, the critical properties of the internet in non-technical terms. They're inspired by the network architecture and I won't go into the details of them. But that's one of the frameworks where you can say if you lose these critical properties, if you're sliding down the scale away from these properties, then you run into the risk of fragmentation. So this is the approach that we took. Another framework you can look at and, and, and approach is, is that of the public core. The public core is a framework that was uh, uh, developed by a think tank in the Netherlands and later uh, uh, further uh, analyzed and defined by the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace. Um, that's another framework and lens through which you can look at the internet and say, okay, we're, 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 we're impacting elements of, uh, of the public core and that might lead to fragmentation. I think one of the things that we've done uh, in this document is also, by doing that, by using this type of non-technical frameworks, frameworks that do not specify exactly the technology that's being used, we allow for evolution. Because the internet really is still evolving. And I think that's important, that we don't ossify, as, it's, it's, uh, as, as we usually say, the internet in its current state. We need to continuously be able to invo uh, um, 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 uh, uh, evolve it. Another aspect of uh, fragmentation that we looked at was uh, basically uh, uh, what I would call the evolution of the edge whereby uh, what we see is that there is a lot of uh, uh, changing in, in, in routing behavior. Uh, private companies building transit to, or building their own net, uh, network uh, uh, compared to using transit to, to get close to the user. And that might cause a fragmentation on, uh, of a different sort what basically the digital divide, increasing the digital divides of users that uh, are close to that type of infrastructure and users that are not. And that has impact on the application layer. There might be users that have a very good user experience and there might be users that do not have a good user experience. And that is due by the way that the internet evolves in, in more richer parts of the world uh, or, uh, uh, versus less connected parts of the world. Um, Hard to catch within those critical frameworks that, that I just mentioned, but it is a, a point that we, we, we point out in the document. Going to the recommendations. Um, so the recommendations are basically look at these frameworks. Use those frameworks, these critical properties or the public core um, and, and uh, make sure that together we protect these properties. Make sure that we can continue to inter-network and provide a global network to everybody that brings the opportunities to actually do all this user stuff. If we fragment on the user uh, layer but still have a, a global network that connects us all, we have a chance to de de, uh, defragment on that user level. But once we have fragmented the internet technical infrastructure, that fragmentation will also be reflected in the, in, in the, user, in the user space. So it's, it's much more important, oh, it's not much more important, it's very important to take care that, that, that uh, uh, those properties are, are protected and we have to do that together. There are very few ways to actually understand how that fragmentation is, is, is happening. There are very few measurements around that look into uh, on a, a longitudinal scale on what the evolution is uh, 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 that impact uh, 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 f that fragmentation, uh, um, impact fragmentation and how it's caused and how it evolves. Um, this, is, this is really a call for people to, to set up measurements and think creatively of 
on, on how you would assess these uh, 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 fragmentation on the technical layer. Once proposals are introduced either on the policy or, the crit uh, or on, the, on the technical layer in, in standardization efforts, for instance, uh, do, do uh, assess them against these critical properties. Do assess them against frameworks and see if we lose interoperability. See if we lose the ability to connect. If that is the case, perhaps it's not such a good idea. And of course, we have to, we're into this together. Um, and uh, the multi-stakeholder approach is a, is a, is a good thing uh, in order to make sure that what is being delivered, both by the private sector developing these technologies and the technical communities uh, working in, on these technologies, as well as by the civil uh, uh, society and the governments to make sure that we stay globally connected and don't split up this, this this, this network of networks. I think that's, that's the summary. That's great, thank you, Olaf. And um, we have Suresh online, so uh, let me check, actually, do we? <laughs> yeah, I do. Okay, I'm you, here. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Shiva. Thanks a lot. Like, uh, thank you for that excellent summary. And um, there's like very little fault in there, so I'm just going to go over. A uh, few things that I think are important and then kind of give you a little some minor hints to improve. But I think the key part that this thing got right is that the Internet is a decentralized set of networks, right? There's no single point of um, choke point of control over this. There is like multiple people who uh, I would say collaboratively got together and, and built this large network. And I think that's a key um, thing to protect. Right? Like, and, and that does not mean fragmentation. That's by design that these networks are like independent and decentralized, right? And what really holds them together is the technology that uh, offers the interoperability. I think that's like something that you got like really like well done in the first piece of this, where we talk about the technology being the thing that holds stuff together and, and not really the administration of them. And, and I think that's like a key uh, point to emphasize. And the second thing is like on the critical properties of the internet, I think openness is one of them. And, and also the um, incremental deployability of stuff. Like, and it kind of ties into your, I would say, lack of ossification, right? Like, you know, like new technologies keep getting deployed on the internet, right? So for example, we had like IPv6 come in, you know, like at some point we ran into a situation where there's like more than 4 billion people on the internet. And then we had like ways to kind of get around it and it takes time, but we are able to build newer things on top. And we, we've had technologies on the internet now that the internet pioneers couldn't have imagined, right? They, everything depends on it. So the, the, the way in which like, you know, we can put like newer things on the internet and still expect to like them to work with people around the world is really because of the openness and the connectivity that's there. So it's something that we should strive to preserve, uh, like you said. And um, so the other kind of key thing in there is that um, the layering principles of the internet as well. So like the, the, the internet kind of holds together at like you know the layer three and four kind of of the OSI model like in a in a very high level and there's also applications that like ha we have a rich variety of applications but as long as we keep the kind of technologies and the lower layers to a like a, I would say a globally interoperable minimum I think like things are going to be good right and that's what we should also look for and also try not to push in I would say, um, so I think like um, uh, Marielza talked a little bit about the content in there, right? So the, the question is, should the, should the content filtering happen in the lower layers or the higher layers? And, and I think like I would posit it should happen at the higher layers because it's kind of, we are talking about like transporting, staying connected while enforcing like, you know, millions of laws, like, you know, state laws, like country laws and, and, and local laws are like very different around the world. So like, you know, instead of trying to um, like do this at like a lower layer, which the whole world shares, uh, like, you know, we should kind of try to keep it at the higher layers where that belong. And that's also alluded to in the document. And uh, one of the things is like the messaging was given as an example, Olaf, right? And uh, we have like, you know, something very positive happening recently in the space with the multi-stakeholders um, architecture is that the Europe came up with this like Digital Markets Act, right? Like which opened us the gatekeepers to open up the communications and uh, the IETF, we started work on something called Mimi, which allows like interoperating at the message layer. So like, you know, th this is like a really good, I would say blueprint to follow where like, you know, the, the governments and the policy organizations 
and the technical community, we all work together to have these common goals of increasing the openness of the internet and people being able to connect. And uh, for the measurement, I think that's a critical piece of off and, and I think um, we need to put a lot more effort into it, right? And we need to have a lot more measurement points across the globe and like kind of be able to have a platform where people can use. Like, you know, it's not just for us to do stuff, but also build a platform such as like the RIPE Atlas is a platform like that, uh, that exists today where people can run their own experiments on this platform with the probes that exist. So maybe we should like let other people uh, with ideas to measure things could use the same kind of platform to like build their own metrics on how they see the fragmentation as like instead of like us prescribing some metrics. So that's something uh, that's actually really good as well. And um, I'm totally with you on like the multi-stakeholder approach. I think it has worked really well to bring the internet to this level. And I think we should really continue going down that approach to like work collaboratively and make sure that we learn from the uh, past lessons we've had. And that brings me to like uh, my last 20 seconds to critique it. And, and, and the critique is really like, we kind of need a little bit more references out of this document. And uh, so like, you know, talk about like principles, let's say like RFC 1958, which talks about the architecture of the internet and principles and so on. I think it's like very interesting reading for a lot of people who are coming in from the policy sphere uh, to who look at like, you know, what are the technical things that, that led to the internet being the way it is and it, why it's like very good for growth. I think that's probably gonna be my uh, only critique on this. Okay, thank you so much, Suresh, and thanks for joining us online. Um, that was really, really useful to get your feedback on, um, on, the, on that chapter, but also you made connections to the other chapters uh, as including the, the user experience one, and that's also key. We do see these different elements of the framework as intersecting, of course. Um, the point is to help to provide uh, a lens by which to have this discussion. Um, and so if, if you all have comments on that, um, please do, do, of course, share. And you also, I think you made a point about referencing, about clarity of terms, about definitions which we also got in written feedback. So that is something um, we, we can certainly incorporate. But I'll turn over now to Bruna, um, and uh, Bruna will be facilitating this part of the discussion, which is really to hear from you. Uh, and so please do, please do get engaged. We'll also be looking at the online participants for any questions and reflections there. Thanks, Bruna. Thanks so much. Um, Yes, as we said, this is the feedback moment of the session, right? So any questions or comments you might have um, are very much welcome. We have some microphones in the room, so if you want to add some thoughts or just ask questions to the panelists, you can come to them. But I guess I'll start with one remote question, who is from um, Foley Herbert um, from Togo. And um, his question is, I would like to know how we can reach every, how can we reach every citizen in the world? Especially how can we overcome language barriers? If contents can be translated into our local languages, um, that would be very good. So, and also he made a comment about the more people are aware of splinternet damages and danger, the more they will be ready and be prepared to fight against um, splinternet and to defend their right to get access to available internet. So that's the first one. We get from this, um, my suggestion would be to take three rounds of questions, like three questions in one round, and then um, I'll divert back to the panelists. So we can start there. Hello, my name is Mia Kulevin. I'm also a member of the Internet Architecture Board as Serge. It's more a comment than a question. I would like to comment on the technical fragmentation part. Um, Olaf talked a lot about interconnectivity. You also mentioned this like 50% definition from Heide Heidemann, which is like really, the 50% the makes sense in a mathematical sense because if you have less than 50%, it means you have the internet and you have another network, which is not the internet, which is just not connected, right? But at 50%, you actually have two internets. You don't know which one is real internet anymore, and there's not, nothing like two internets. There's only one internet. <laughs> so, you know, this is very mathematical, and that's the point where it actually breaks. That's the point where there's no way to get back to one internet, and we want, really want, don't get, want to get there, and I think we're not on the way to get there, but, like, if we get there, it's really done, <laughs> then it's broken. <laughs> yes, then, you're, then it's too late. Um, but what I wanted to say is 
that it's not only about interoperability or interconnectivity. It's also about um, the ability to to innovate and evolve the internet, right? So if we if we put barriers into place where we cannot evolve the internet anymore, where we cannot introduce new protocols, because all the protocols or the way the internet is designed, it has to be very extensible. We were able, even so that's not done completely, we were able to introduce even a new protocol on the IP layer, having IPv4, having IPv6, and it did not break the internet. We're still interconnected. And this is like all internet protocols are designed this way. You always have to have a way to evolve, to go on. And if you put barriers in the way where we cannot evolve anymore, that's, I think, where we lead to, which lead to whatever fragmentation or to like a very negative outcome, because that means not only that we cannot change the technology anymore, we cannot adapt, we cannot make it more secure, we cannot make it more flexible, we cannot uh, make it more faster or whatever, better performance. It also means that whatever we do on top of the internet will be limited because we cannot adapt to it anymore. And then we're stuck. And then like all the benefits we get from the internet where we see like this positive impact on the society, on our economy, and so, and so on, doesn't happen anymore. And that's like, that's the point where we're still connected, but the internet wouldn't be as useful as it is today. Thanks, Miriam. Um, right here in the middle, can we get a second question or comment? Thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank the, the, the policy network that they put the internet fragmentation into perspective and we, we understood today what is meant by internet fragmentation. Obviously, obviously, we have three dimensions, the policies and the procedures, we have the user experience, and we have the technical part. Uh, and that lets us understand the subject much better. In the policy and the procedure level, uh, first, what gives us comfort is that there is a general consensus and agreement that we don't want the internet to be fragmented. So all our effort is toward not fragmenting the internet, and this is and this gives us a comfort in this matter. Uh, but our concern here is that uh, regions, and sometimes on national level, there were policies, uh, or let's say uh, treaties, or commitments that represent the interest of that regions, or represent the national interest, and in, in terms of social and economic, and, and I wouldn't say all of them, but which, whatever represents the interest of the socio-economics of this region or national, and it is there. And uh, so uh, these commitments or uh, these frameworks or these agreements or treaties um, represent the interests of these regions or these people. Or And there should be a thin line between saying that this represents the fragmentation uh, or represents the interests or the benefit of that group. Maybe this is something that we need uh, or, or something that needs to be addressed. Uh, at least in terms of that, if there are any regional or national arrangements, there is a certain level that they should not conflict with the overall of the uh, uh, unity or the unification of the internet. Uh, going back to the user experience and Vittorio as an advocate of user experience, it gives us a kind of a trust that the uh, indicators or the elements that has been identified, the five elements, represents really, uh, truly, the user experience, at least principles that we don't need to be harmed. And actually, when it comes to user experience, there is nothing regional or national. You, internet users should be all equal. So in that terms, we need to have a global understanding of that this is the minimum of what is known, uh, or what is, should be uh, a user experience. Uh, going to the, uh, uh, the technical side, thank you that you limited this to the interoperability. And thank you that you clarified that decentralization or lack of connectivity or choice is not considered the fragmentation. What gives us assurances is that the industry, or even the technical community, built all its work toward interoperability. And, uh, this is something that at least we feel uh, trusted that it will continue. But again, bringing the matter to digital divide, it means returning this again to the user experience, which is now a wide open issue. And this may have implications, why it has implications. In some parts of the world, this may, uh, a controlled user experience means, uh, let's say, a negative aspect on the social status of that user. And the social status of that user can reflect limiting his freedom. 
uh, and sometimes limiting his social freedom or limiting his economic freedom. Uh, and this, so from all of that really, while we have some arrangements on policies and the procedures, and we have some arrangements on the technical side, we are wide open on the user experience so far, and maybe this makes the start of toward the dimension of user experience more important than going first to the policies or the technical side. Thank you. Thank you very much. And right here. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Barry Lieber. Um, Olaf referred to a comment that I made the other day about uh, uh, harmful fragmentation versus the fragmentation that's part of the internet that's the way the internet is intended to work. And what I said was that harmful fragmentation is the part where um, it, it, it puts us in a situation that is not the way the internet was intended to work. I, I come up to comment about the sort of gray area. The, we, we think of harmful fragmentation as uh, something where, let's say, a service provider blocks uh, its competitors' access to its competitors, or a country blocks certain websites at, a, at the IP level or DNS resolution level and that kind of thing. I've had a conversation with a colleague who works for Meta about whether, for example, Facebook causes fragmentation, uh, blocking off the content that Facebook users can see from uh, people outside Facebook who can't get to that content. And of course, my Meta colleague thinks that's not fragmentation. That's just the way an application layered on top of the internet works. And one thing that, that he says is uh, you know, Facebook is not the internet. Uh, the World Wide Web is not the internet. These are application layers that are put on top of the internet, but from the user's point of view, that often is the internet. So this kind of gets to Vittorio's area of um, fragmenting the user experience. So I, I just sort of want, to think, want, want us all to think about that a bit more, these gray areas that uh, uh, change the user experience in other ways that, are, that, that we don't normally think of as fragmentation and maybe we should start wondering whether it is and whether it's good or bad. Um, just just more, more to think about, I think. So. Thank you very much. Um, next up. Hi there, thank you. I'm Christopher Tate from Connect Free Corporation and Internet3. We think that the future of the internet is really having everyone own their own IP address. I think that up until now, um, you know, there's been huge amounts of cost involved in creating infrastructure that has led to um, ISPs and others owning blocks of IP addresses and having the difficulty of really getting these IP addresses out on the end. And so um, by allowing everyone to generate their own IP address through cryptographic uh, public key pairs, um, we can give everyone an internet uh, IP address. And so um, we think that there's something kind of really cool going on here in Japan because the um, the government has implemented a law against NTT in the 1990s so that they had the NTT uh, own the network, but they weren't able to become an ISP. They have fundamentally created a uh, countrywide uh, layer two switching network where all ISPs can enter onto the network. And so what that has allowed us to do is become a ISP of individuals. And what that means is that every computer on the NTT network using our software can have an IP address and connect and, and build a presence on the network. So I think there's kind of an interesting thing about decoupling um, IP addresses from networks. You know, obviously, um, it's very hard to have individuals create networks. Um, but we think that um, there should be a decoupling between the infrastructure, the actual hardware physical la layer, and the uh, layer three IP uh, layer. So um, you know, we've proven that this is a possible thing. I think that uh, there's a lot of discussions to be had, and we hope to uh, join in these discussions. So thank you for your time. Thanks so much for your comments. I didn't see a fourth line there, so I'm very sorry. Um, please go ahead, Laura. Uh, hello. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the panel and the, the report and the work of, of the network in general. My name is Laura Pereira. I'm a delegate from the Brazilian Youth, Youth uh, Fellowship. And uh, we know that uh, the defense of democracy, integrity, and information integrity is one of the main fields to, to actually uh, adopt a more protective uh, view of the digital space currently, and in that sense, sometimes uh, to cause fr fragmenta fragmentation and uh, to risk the integrity of the digital space in general. Uh, actually, in the Brazilian chapter of Internet Society, we actually made an experimental application of the proposed concept of user experience fragmentation 
to collaborate on a public consultation by Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, Committee on Platform Re Regulation, alerting to the unadverted risks of platform regulation when it does not consider these kinds of uh, harms to the critical properties of the network. Uh, however, as mentioned by your presentation, it's not easy to balance democracy, integrity, defense overall in the general sense and harmful fragmentations. Uh, is it possible to reach this sort of balance uh, by using the concept of user experience uh, fragmentation? Do you intend to advance on this perspective? Is it a goal of the network? Uh, how do you see this, this issue in a more detailed way? Thank you for your, your presentation. Thanks a lot, Laura. Just reflect that I'm closing the queue, but we're going to take the last three comments, so please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the panel, and I uh, appreciate the discourse on internet fragmentation, but also just like the difficulties surrounding understanding it. And so uh, I can keep it very pointed to the discussion points that were listed. I am curious, as we progress with initiatives like this, do we continue to do so without engaging regional or cultural leaders in areas that experience shutdowns? or at the very least massive hindrances to their freedom of access to open information. There was a point where it was national governments are what we are hoping to interact with and no new you know, stakeholders to uh, involve in governance. However, there does seem to be, um, there does seem to be valuable parallels between like, looking at the way that communities who have been oppressed in the past have also taken a stand and helped create legislation and international policy to curtail that from happening to any other group. Um, and furthermore, uh, I would like to raise a discussion point of meaningful connectivity, as is defined, as is to, alluded to by the UN Development Goals. Uh, with the rise of satellite availability and private corporate satellite availability internet um, and LLM sophistication, do we recognize the potential for not only fragmentation but quality of online experience? Um, is this something where we see fragmentation leading from billions of people being priced out of meaningful connectivity? And does this appear to be a perfect storm for exasperating the digital divide, not necessarily closing it? So how does internet fragmentation policy design, like how does it design itself to effectively account for rapid development on these emerging fronts, taking into account their incredible potential to create disparity of access to meaningful connectivity? Thank you. Thanks a lot, next comment. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michel Lambert. I'm coming from uh, Montreal. I work with an organization called Equality, which is doing technology to support freedom online. Uh, this is my first participation to the uh, policy network. I'm particularly interested by it. Hopefully, uh, we will manage to uh, create some governance that will prevent uh, fragmentation. But I come from a background where we tend to believe that these discussions are difficult and sometimes they take more time. That and we need to develop alternative technologies. So I'd like to uh, use this floor now just to invite people to join us in Montreal. We are organizing a conference called the SplinterCon, and the idea is really to bring uh, together the people developing new technologies which are going to allow us eventually to you know, build bridges or make holes into walls uh, so that people can continue to enjoy the, uh, the internet. So if you are interested to be part of that process, please go to splintercon.net and join us in Montreal in December to develop those technologies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next comment right here. Uh, thank you. First of all, um, thank you for the excellent discussion on internet fragmentation. Uh, I have a general question. Um, we want the internet to be inclusive and open, borderless, global network, which gives equal opportunities to everybody who's connected and those who are to be connected. Uh, but because of uh, a geopolitical situation, trade concerns, and uh, other factors, the response of nation states, some of the nation states, is that they take certain actions and enact certain laws that may come under the ambit of digital sovereignty or digital protectionism, um, and which may result in either technical, commercial, or governmental fragmentation of the internet. Um, so uh, my question uh, from you would be that uh, how do you, I mean, you've given some very, very good recommendations, but given the governance structure of the internet, uh, how do you see that, uh, how easy or difficult it would be, it would be to um, address this challenge of um, implementing those, regulation, those recommendations um, 
and especially we, we see the internet evolving. I mean, it's becoming more decentralized, the Web 3.0. So how um, do you see addressing that particular challenge? And we talked about the five uh, principles, the DFI principles. So if there are certain laws enacted which may compromise any of those principles, so how do you see addressing that challenge? Thank you. Thanks a lot. And last but not least, how? Uh, <clears throat> good morning. My name is Raul Echeverria. I'm from Latin American Internet Association. Um, I, I think that's that uh, we are in, uh, sometimes we are in, in a, a in a loop trying to define what is uh, internet fragmentation or not, and it uh, make me remember when we discussed it in the past about uh, network neutrality and, and uh, somebody introduced the the, the the expression the concept, uh, but uh, we never had a, a, an agreed definition on that. So it's a, we lost a lot of energy discussing about what is network neutrality instead of discussing what we want to avoid. And if we look at, at the, at the, at the um, topic of this, uh, of, of this event, is the internet uh, we want. So the, instead of uh, trying to define what is uh, internet fragmentation, we, we have to focus on what things we want not to happen. And, uh, and so they, and, and I, I still, th I, I think that the, the work the, the policy network is doing is, is, is impressive. Uh, it's very good and congratulations for that. And I, I have been part uh, sometimes in the, the discussions, uh, but we should focus also on more clear recommendations. Uh, what things uh, that's, uh, for example, for governments, don't block apps. Uh, don't don't uh, uh, adopt policies that create different experiences in, in internet for users in the <laughs> in the same country. That is, uh, or, or in the in the globe. So this is the the, the, the kind of things that we have to recommend. That uh, of course uh, I, I I heard what the, the colleague said about uh, uh, not ac the, when we when we don't partic don't participate in a in a in a platform or in a in, in a given space. Uh, we don't have access to the information that is there. But uh, the point is that if I want to be part of that, I can. But in some places, or due to some, to some policies, even if I want to be a TikTok user or, <laughs> or Amazon or buy something on Amazon or whatever, I can't do it. And so this is a fragmentation. But so instead, I, we will be in a loop if we try to say, oh, this is fragmentation, this is not. So, but there are things that we clearly don't want to happen because that's the internet we don't want. Thank you. Thanks, Hau. Um, and I'm going to need to apologize to the two of you, Robin and Wolfgang, because we've closed the line and, and we have a deadline to leave this room at 10.30, right? So, um, and at the same time, we, we also have the process for um, bringing input to the discussion open until the 20th of, the, of October, but we really want um, also the panelists to be able to comment on that. So, um, Olaf, Jordan, Ross, Vittorio, do you guys would like to... Add any thoughts to the questions and comments? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, well, not a lot. Um, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, a number of points were made that are, are relevant and, and critical. Um, uh, one of the, the points that was made was by Barry Leiba uh, uh, asking for more nuance. And I, I think that's a fair comment. But we're also trying to keep this policy papers brief. Um, and when you do brevity, you sort of lose, lose nuance. Um, Miria made a, uh, uh, made a good point. Um, the ability to innovate and evolve is one that we should protect. Uh, uh, that is indeed the idea. Um, we, I made reference to the critical properties. Um, and one of the critical properties uh, that we have defined uh, and, and, and that we sort of introduced also in this paper is having an open architecture of interoperable building blocks. The idea that the internet consists out of building blocks and protecting that open architecture whereby we can evolve, I think is important. That sort of speaks to uh, the gentleman uh, that, that I forgot his name, but I know from the Metro advertisement. Um, uh, he, he invented something new. Um, uh, uh, I don't know if that works. I don't know how that will scale across the internet. Um, uh, and as uh, Amiria also pointed out, we, we did this transition for from V4 to V6, that could have failed. There is technical fragmentation between V4 and V6. 
And the onus has been on the people who developed and are implementing uh, V6 and give everybody their own IP address, because that was the intention of the V6 address space, to make sure that that interoperability with the V4 uh, 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 internet uh, continued to exist. And that has been 20 years of hard engineering work. Introducing something new will mean that the onus is on the entities that are introducing something new to make sure that that interoperability exists. The critical properties says there are common protocols. They don't say it's IPv4, IPv6, yet another protocol. The internet should be able to continue to evolve. But we have to agree on something to keep that uh, interoperability going. Um, finally, the comment on meaningful uh, connectivity. Uh, when I talked about that evolution of the edge, this is a point that we're making in the paper under the name of death of transit. The idea is indeed about having meaningful connectivity. If the internet evolves in haves and haves not, then there will be fragmentation too. And being priced out of the market um, is indeed a way to, to, to be fragmented. And, and mind you, we have a fragmented user experience nowadays. There are many people who cannot afford being on the internet. And I think that's uh, something that we all have to work on, making sure that people who want to connect can connect. Thank you very much, Olaf. Um, Ross, next. Yeah, thanks so much. And that's actually a great transition line, Olaf, because I wanted to come in on some of the first comments about um, local languages, for example, and whatnot. I think this goes back to the broader thematic point we tried to capture in our chapter, talking about the importance of inclusion in global internet governance bodies. Um, and I think local languages, making sure people can participate um, despite um, their cultural or regional background is so important. So I really wanted to pick up on that point in particular. And um, there were further points about uh, particular regional contexts and whatnot. Absolutely, I think, the, I, I really wanted to highlight the role of the IGF's national and regional initiatives in this regard. I think these are great multi-stakeholder uh, spaces where people can come and talk about those uh, uh, local nuances, regional contexts, absolutely. Um, and I think, better coordination between internet governance bodies, as we've been talking about, can hopefully help capture those and bring those different voices together as well. So not only just having these regional spaces, the NRIs, um, I was lucky enough to attend the Africa IGF two weeks ago, which is an absolutely fantastic opportunity to hear about um, some of these perspectives, but also um, to make sure that these are captured in the broader global discussions within these global internet governance bodies themselves as well. Um, so thank you so much. And just to say in general, um, a big thanks to the audience for the participation here. And please do, if you think of anything else, feel free to uh, grab me on the sidelines throughout the rest of this week. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ross Vittorio. Yeah, very quickly, a couple of points. There's not time for everything. So please join the discussion on the mailing list and in the call. Um, well, first of all, uh, I think some of the comments pointed out uh, what is the, the problem that we had to deal with when discussing the user experience level, which is that uh, the user experience for mentioned is really, fragmentation is really a, a big elephant, as big as the planet, and people only see a very tiny bit of it and, and believe that that is fragmentation. And so okay, if you talk to people from Silicon Valley, from the US West Coast, mostly they complain about what governments are doing in authoritarian countries or even in the EU with the privacy laws and whatever. And if you talk to my friends in Europe, they complain about what the Silicon Valley platforms do. And everybody thinks that's the big problem in terms of user fragmentation. So the first step is agreeing on something, on whether something is a problem and why, and then starting to work together on that in a very pragmatic way, because if we focus on definitions, we will not go anywhere. And the other thing I wanted to say is that uh, 
in the end, what we are facing now is the tension between the original dream of a united planet, borderless, uh, and everybody talking with each other and uh, freely, and, and uh, the reality of differences of values, interests, uh, economies, and whatever, and languages throughout the planet. And so to a certain extent, you do need to preserve the local level and even the national sovereignty, because that, that's also a way to preserve the independence of peoples, something that was often hard fought. And, uh, and to give them a way, each, to give each citizen of the world a way to have influence over the network and not just on, uh, give it to the people that manage the network globally and have more influence on it. But on the other hand, you have to avoid breaking the globalness of the internet. And so this is what we have to be concerned about, finding a balance. Thank you. Thank you, and um, I'm sorry that we don't have time to provide the commentators from the earlier part of the session with the opportunity to respond, but the good news is that there is still time to respond after the session via email, or indeed you can come and talk to us, and uh, we are giving a deadline of the 20th of October, um, and you of course have time to look at, in detail at the paper online, um, and the, the slides will also be available. I think they really nicely summarize the in-depth work that has been done. Um, so what we wanted to do, what the original uh, mandate and intention of this uh, policy network was to provide some clarity to an incredibly complex and indeed controversial topic. I hope that you agree that we have um, to some extent done that, but it is not, not over. Um, it is an evolving, just as the internet is, an evolving uh, framework and an evolving piece of work. Please do join us um, in, in continuing that work. And uh, I think that is, that is it, apart from thanking you all for being here, for your contributions to the panelists, to the drafters, to the very active um, uh, members of the network who gave their time to, to put this paper together. Thank you. And um, please do continue to, to be engaged. Um, we will be here um, during the IGF, but you can also email us. Uh, women, Bruno, is there anything I missed? No, thank you. Maybe if you can just have the slide, because there was the link to the uh, web page. OK, and there you can see, because on the web page of the uh, PNF, there is a link to the uh, discussion paper, and there is also explained how you can, uh, can react. So looking forward to your comments. Uh, and the only thing I want to add is thank you to, uh, thank you to everyone.